am the AIS ELA instructional lead with JCPS and my Twitter handle is there, Sandra L. Hogue. Um, and so if you'd like to connect on Twitter, I'd love to see you there. Um, this session's journey, we're going to, we're looking at, I guess I could give you the title of the session, Write All About It, Writing to Accelerate Learning. And um, in this session, I always like to give the why in my sessions and then the what or with anything. I'm, anytime I'm working with teachers or kids, I like for them to understand why we're doing something and then what we're doing, right? So then they have... Um, buy-in when it comes to attaching that new learning to skills they already possess. And so we'll start with looking at what KDE says about writing and where writing fits in the curriculum as a whole. Um, and we're also and that it's that most of that will come from a new document that KDE has just released this year. And then the second, of course, are the standards, which are also from KDE. That really could be one bullet there. Uh, but the standards that uh, were released and then updated by KDE uh, a couple of years ago. Then we'll look at the what, uh, writing in early primary, writing in late primary, writing in intermediate and middle grades, writing in high school, each of those uh, easily could fill uh, a whole year's worth of study, right? But we have 30 minutes, so I hope to give you nuggets uh, and that will plant seeds that will give you things to think about that you can fold into your practice no matter the level of uh, where you work primarily. So the why, hearing from KDE, uh, as I said, they released this document recently, just this year, that helps to provide clarity and additional information around what the standards are asking of us when it comes to teaching writers. And so this is a live link. If you uh, connect with the slide deck, you can go directly to this 30-ish page document. But in it, um, it, it, won't, it, it won't ring uh, unfamiliar. In fact, you will we'll be able to say, oh yeah, this is familiar. These are things we've always valued, um, but they're just once again seeking to clarify and provide a bit more information about them. They feature the three types of writing. We know writing to learn, writing to demonstrate learning, and writing for publication. And then they also speak to composition standards one, two, and three, argument and opinion writing, informative explanatory, and narrative writing. They also provide uh, scoring resources that are aligned with KDE's on-demand writing scoring rubric, but they also align with what it means to write well. So it's not like they've made up these grand ideas of what it means to do well just on KPREP. They have aligned um, those rubrics with what it means to write well in each of those contexts. So those first three bullets really, or arrows are designed for kind of that zooming in. Let's look at the specifics of what they're asking us to do. The, re uh, the fourth bullet, and really is, it really is one of my favorite and probably because the first three are already really familiar to me. Uh, but the fourth one really uh, provides a purpose to the others. So it gives us a reason to understand how it, how, why it's important to write to learn, why it's important to write to demonstrate learning, why it's important to write to publish. And it gives, once again, some, some purpose to argument writing. How might I use my voice to argue my stance on an issue? Uh, how might I use my voice to inform and to tell stories? And so that, that, um, the role of research in composition, uh, it, it helps us to understand how we find out a bit more and then use that to articulate our voices to a broader audience. Uh, the next one is uh, the standards themselves. And so once again, this is a link to the standards I know with a contract in Kentucky, you know about the standards if you teach ELA. However, I have this on many of the slides in this presentation because as a teacher with a contract in JCPS and who works with KDE, we have to keep the standards out front. I say oftentimes our kids do not, and they don't. They don't have to care about the standards, but as a person in charge of facilitating the learning environment, I have to care about the standards. I have to find ways to bridge who the students are as people, and bring who they are as people in contact with things I need them to learn according to what the state has outlined. And so in the, the, the uh, standards document, it's over 500 pages. I don't know anyone who's read it cover to cover, including the people who authored the entire thing because they did that in segments. Uh, it is designed for you to pull things that are most relevant to your work. And when it comes to composition, uh, they have these fat paragraphs and in the overview section for uh, K-5 and 6 to 8 and 9 to 12 that give you, once again, this pocket-sized bit of information of things you need to consider if you teach writers at that level. So I just really like this handy, handy, I can bring it 
out front, it can remind me of the big picture for my grade band. And then I go to the standards at my level and ha I have better understanding or clarity about uh, how my piece fits with that bigger picture at my grade level. And so now moving into the what, um, writing in early primary. Um, once again, standards, there's the link there because we have to keep that out front. Um, I consult when I, when I look at writing and the best practices in writing the National Writing Project. They have been working on studying, developing resources, researching, uh, writing at every content le level from preschool to postgraduate work for decades, right? So they are the national leaders when it comes to having a voice about what it means to teach writers well. And so I'm part of that organization and, and really every interaction I've ever had with them makes me better. And so I had an opportunity to work with them on a project um, on an institute looking at early primary writers in Philadelphia this past year. And uh, the process that we worked through and discussed and talked about and wrestled with is the one you see on the screen here with our early primary writers remember they are just learning letters and sounds they but um it, and and they have yet they have these colorful things to say think about um kids say the darndest things, right? They have amazing things to share with us that oftentimes stop us in our tracks. And so their level, their ability to communicate in the natural science system of speaking uh, does not mirror their ability to capture that in the unnatural science system of writing, written communication. So we have to open up opportunities to allow them to grow in that way. And one of the realities is writing is one of those things that will not grow if we don't allow kids to, I call it a muscle, we don't flex that writing muscle, then they'll never grow. So in this early primary cycle they presented with the National Writing Project, it allow, allows room for kiddos to flex their writing muscles so that they can begin to capture on paper some of those many wonderful things that we know they have to say uh, that they articulate verbally. And so in this process, they draw a story or they draw their information. Uh, then they go into kid writing, stretching out words. They um, use approximations, they use their best spelling, they use the word wall, they use the things that they have access to in order to capture their thoughts on paper. Then the third step is what uh, the National Writing Project calls adult spelling, but you'll see I call it book spelling because uh, it is true that not every adult spells well, right? Uh, we we um, don't want to assign perfection to adults because that leads kiddos to believe that all adults are perfect and we know that adults are flawed in many ways. Langston Hughes has a, a piece that I read um, from time to time where he talks about from a kid's voice the first time he realized that adults lie, right? So assigning perfection to adults is just a slippery slope. So I like calling it uh, book spelling. And then they're sharing in that process where their voices deserve to be heard. And so they go through this cycle of flexing their writing muscles and they become more fluent writers. And so uh, the, this is, this, um, this image here is also a link, once again, to the full site that describes kid writing and provides far more background than what I've articulated here. Also available, um, and something I'd like to encourage with our early primary writers is what EL Education offers. Uh, it is a website tried and true. Uh, it passes all of the, um, um, the measurements on the rubric for high quality instruction for kiddos. And so they have material at even early primary levels that help us to understand uh, how reading and writing and, and deeper learning, uh, because often their units are attached to content like science and social studies, which is where I'd love to see. And I'm encouraging us to go as a district, especially in our elementary schools with thinking about literacy. And so if you look at the cycle from the National Writing Project, it could be easy to say, well, my goodness, you know, we start the writing process, we start the, the writing in the fall, and then those writer's notebooks that we have kids to decorate so beautifully tend to fall to the wayside, and that's because it becomes stale, right? So drawing my story every day, if I do that every day from August until November, I'm done with that process, right? And what EL Education does is it gives them purpose behind telling or capturing that information. And so uh, it, it, it attaches it to, for example, a compelling question. Here's an example of student work that, you know, I have limited access here because it is NTI and I have a, a two kiddos here. And so uh, this, the writing on the, the sample you see on the left is work that my son crafted just this week. Uh, he was reading an informational text and I taught him how to capture double entry journal, uh, a double entry journal around what he, um, 
was reading. And so, you know, once again, you have the the kids spelling, the approximations. I was not in there saying, no, that's spelled wrong. No, you have, you know, but I did remind him if you're trying to spell this word, you have access to it right there in the book. So you should utilize that. And so uh, just in that gentle way, I, I encouraging him to use language to capture what he has to say. And then my feedback uh, at the bottom there. But that's just one example of writing to learn with our early primary writers. And then um, once again, writing in late primary, it looks different. And uh, once again, here are the standards because we need to keep those out front. But another document that proves really helpful when we're thinking about our practices with late primary uh, students is this um, this document that is from, it, it comes from the work of the U.S. Department of Education. So once again, that's, um, you know, that's the national level uh, of validation for what is best practice in teaching writers. And in this document, uh, it, it comes through uh, the branch of what works clearinghouse. And so they've developed these recommendations for what it should look and sound and feel like to develop effectiveness in elementary writers. And so they recommend, once again, something I already mentioned, which was time for students to write, flexing that writing muscle. And what I'm advocating for with our schools now is not a separate writing workshop. The reality is now I, I have to say more about my lens. I work with the accelerated improvement schools. And for those of you who don't know, uh, who we are, we are the 35 schools within JCPS that are performing at the bottom 5% of the state. And so we have a lot of ground to cover as uh, individual campuses. We have a lot of acceleration that we're charged with. And so what I have found with, in addition to having uh, lots of acceleration needed, we also find ourselves with uh, greater amounts of trauma, greater amounts of disruptive behaviors, greater amounts of attendance issues. We have lots of hurdles that others, I'm not saying are absent from other schools, but we have them in greater volume than the average school. And I often argue this with folks who say, well, wait a minute, we're over here and we have those challenges too. And I don't doubt that. But what I'm saying is we are AIS for a reason. If you're in the bottom 5% of the state, our needs are different and we have to approach the work differently than everyone else. Because if our needs were identical, there wouldn't even be an umbrella of AIS, right? So uh, in that work, because of all the challenges we face, I am advocating that we not have separate silos of instructional content. So uh, here's my reading time. Okay, I'm going to close that down. Here's my writing time. Okay, I'm going to close that down. Here's my science time. Close that down. Social studies. It's time for lunch. Math time. Right. Uh, the reality is we're in a position where we need to accelerate. I say to my teachers all the time, don't get excited. Don't expect a pat on the back. If you're a third grade teacher and um, you have kids who come to you with a two year deficit because we hear that all the time. Right. Our kids are so far behind. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, and, and you can't celebrate that at the end of third grade, you've gotten a year's worth of growth out of them. Why? Because you've done nothing to address the achievement gap. And so this kiddo who came to you at a first grade level in your third grade classroom, if you moved him or her to a second grade level, they're still moving into fourth grade with what? A two year deficit. So if you get a year and a half, worth of growth, then we'll celebrate that. We'll absolutely applaud that because you are moving in the direction that closes the gap. And we know that school to prison pipeline is real. And so when I say we have a bigger job in AIS, it really is. There's that urgency there that we have to address things differently. So while I'm saying flex their writing muscles on a daily basis, not in this silo, as Heather would agree, uh, it is a killer of really educational progress. That silo of saying, it's my writing time because what it does is wither and dies on the vine. Once again, we get folks who stop teaching writing because other things appear to be more important. Instead, I'm advocating for the use of interdisciplinary units of study where we're using a compelling question as Ryan New and Suzanne Kramer advocated for on the digital channel earlier uh, in NTI where they talked about, we move from a compelling question and then we attach uh, real reasons to use reading and writing and science and social studies to explore answers to those compelling questions. I went all year calling them essential questions, but when we know better, we're supposed to do better. And really their correct term is a compelling question. And so anyway, you, you have them write daily. You help them understand the writing process. I don't need you need to read those to you, but I would like you to look at the third bullet that talks about the need for word processing because we know K-PREP is going digital. And so we're going to have to ensure that we're providing opportunities for kids to craft, to capture their ideas, to take notes, to create products using those typing skills because 
Otherwise, no, uh, it won't really matter how well I've taught kids to use the craft of writing if they aren't able to capture that on that keyboard at the time of Cape Rep. I mean, it will matter. It'll matter in the long run, but it won't. I always say the biggest heartbreak is when students know something, and I've had this happen on Cape Rep before, when I know my kiddos know something, but it doesn't show up on the test. That is the most crushing thing for me as a teacher, and it's crushing for the kids as well because you know they know it, but it's a shift in the presentation of the material that uh, creates that obstacle. So we have to have that awareness and act accordingly. And then they engage as a community of writers. Uh, in intermediate and middle grades, once again, the standards are here. And um, that the um, I'm going to share some nuggets of things that I've used. Um, really, I put this here, but it could be at the elementary. It could all go all the way up to high school because the, the approach of growing writers really is so similar um, that it's applicable across all the grades. But one of the things I've gotten a lot of traction with is Rain, Steam, and Speed. It was introduced to me in the writing project work with Trisha Mealy. Uh, in this book, Fleming, who is the author, uh, presents a process that involved work Work that allows kiddos to build their writing stamina. It does not teach writing craft. I'm going to say that three times for emphasis. It does not teach writing craft. It will not teach writing craft. What it does is move kids beyond that reaction that says, uh, Miss Hogue, how long does it have to be? How much do I have to write? How much do I need to say? Because um, that, uh, you know, for our minimalist students, right, they're only going to give you those two sentences if you say that's how long it has to be. They're only going to give you that five sentence paragraph if that's how explicit you are. And we also, we all know that there are folks who write really well, who use an economy of words. I love a powerful short piece that leaves me stopped in my tracks with just a few words. I talk so much. I've never been able to really craft that way because I'm long winded. And so I just kind of go around the block and down the street because I'm wired that way. But we also know there's power in the economy of words being succinct and tight and to the point. And so what this does, though, is move kids beyond that need to ask you, how much do I need to write? And it's a, a system. And if you click on this, I, I have a one pager that I that I pulled together from Trisha's work because she planted that seed for me that gives you the process. But you give the kids a prompt. You give them time to write. And what I have found in that process that is, uh, if they do it like once a week, by the time they get to that fourth week, they've moved from saying, oh my goodness, I still have more to write. I still have to fit, you know, they, they stop thinking about the quantity of what they feel like they need to write to saying, wait a minute, it's been 30 minutes already. I, I'm not finished saying what I need to say. And so once again, it won't give them writing craft, but it will move them to the point where they're not having meltdowns because they they have to write for 30 minutes because that feels overwhelming. And so what I do as the teacher, this isn't wasted time for me. What I'm doing is mining those pieces for instructional ideas, right? I'm looking at those pieces and saying, oh my goodness, no one is using ending punctuation. And these sentences are run on, run on, run on, right? They never use a period or there are no uh, paragraphs found in this piece or whatever. And so as the teacher, I'm making note of the standards that need to be taught based on these samples that the kids are cranking out. So maybe I teach uh, a mini unit on, on uh, or an inquiry study on what it means to craft a good paragraph or on compound sentence excuse me, compound sentences. And then the next time we have the rain, steam, and speed experience, I can say, you know, we've studied compound sentences. I need to see you guys find at least one meaningful place in your rain, steam, and speed writing today where you're going to capture a compound sentence. So then it moves from now they know better. I can ask them to do better, right? But initially it's just about quantity. And then we know that reading and writing feed one another. And so you grow reading, they'll grow in writing. If you grow writing, they'll grow in their reading. So those things complement one, one another. And so this, this book over here, which each of these are links to the, the Amazon site, not that I'm promoting Amazon, but it'll uh, just take you if you're interested in, in looking at those further. Uh, but in this book, I love the way it's laid out because it'll give you a writing lesson on a craft or something that writers need to consider. And then on the very next page, they give you an example of how to apply that to reading. And so it it keeps that ping pong effect of moving back and forth and kids grow in both. And then Ralph Fletcher tried and true. Um, he's, I, you know, I stalked him at one point, not really, but I, I used to go to the NTA, 
NT, NCTE conference every year and he'd look like, oh my goodness, here she is again. But uh, we're on first name basis now. So, but he he does a beautiful job of providing many lessons where you just kind of get in and say, you know what, my kids are having problems with organizing their ideas and boom, he'll have a mini lesson on how to take them deeper with that. And then over here is Katie Wood Ray's book and I she writes for the youngest writers. So this book was written for uh, all 300 pages or so of it was written for early primary writers because Katie has primarily studied preschool to maybe second grade ish students. But she has a process in here on helping kids to understand craft that uh, is second to none. I've used it with everyone from first grade, kindergarten, first grade to adults. It helps me as an, an adult with, you know, postgraduate work to craft better. And so what it, uh, the process, it's called an organized inquiry. It's in chapter six. And in it, um, it, there's a chart where the students, where if my kiddos are writing poetry or if they're writing prose or if they're writing uh, a literary essay or uh, a, an argument piece. Um, I bring before them a mentor or a few mentors for them to explore or an infographic. It could be really anything, whatever uh, genre they're about to, to, to craft, then I may put those infographics in front of them. And the first column of that chart says, what do we notice about the infographics that are great, that are, have captured our attention and are really, uh, crafted effectively. And then the second column is why do you think the author crafted in that way? So it helps them to understand the intention. So I know many of us have probably a lesson on, you know, uh, similes. And then they pop up in, ev in everything, right? Kids are flexing their writing muscles. They're going to use them ineffectively before they settle into, you know, well-placed similes, right? And that's part of the process. But he helping, pushing them to understand why the author used that crafting technique will give them purpose behind their use of it once they've, you know, kind of played around with it for a while. So what do you notice? Why did the author craft that way? Where have we seen it before so it encourages connection from text to text and then um uh, I'm sorry, what can we call it? Because oftentimes as Katie works with these youngest writers, they're not going to call it alliteration or automatopoeia or hyperbole or metaphor simile. They may not have the language to attach to that, but they may uh, call it something that works for them. Those sound words or every word starts to say, you know, they're going to call uh, it something that makes it makes sense for them. And then the final column is most important because it's uh, examples of using it in my craft. So once again, it opens the door to say, guess what? If Jacqueline Woodson can, Woodson can do it, you can also do it. If Sandra Cisneros, Cynthia Ryland, uh, Christopher Paul Curtis, whoever, if they can do it, then you can try those crafting techniques in your material. So it helps them to grow in their craft. And then you'll see this rain, steam, and speed start to grow once again in quality, uh, not just quantity. And then the final, these are bookends or two of two professional books that I am in love with currently, because to me, they attach writing to this big I'm sorry, interdisciplinary picture that I am promoting for our schools, connecting writing to all learning. And so once again, going back to that notion of a compelling question, and then I'm applying reading, writing, science, social studies, deep thinking, um, and notice how I tied all of those, deeper learning, backpack, all of those in under the umbrella of a compelling question. And kids have meaningful uses of reading, writing, speaking, listening, research, science, and social studies. And so here are a couple of examples from my intermediate writer. As I said, I only have what I have access to here at the house, but this is uh, writing to publish a couple of examples from my, one example from my daughter is just blown up on the right. Uh, we engaged in, um, you know, digital historian project where we're capturing uh, and seeking to answer the question of how has our lives changed? How have our lives changed because of the coronavirus? And so the, this is a, um, an artistic, a digital photo piece that my daughter selected. And then that's the museum like placard that she generated to tell the story of the image. And then we're going to compile those for um for a time capsule of what's happening with, with us right now. Uh, and then moving into thinking about high school, and you've seen this document once again, just like they created that document for elementary, they've cr created it for secondary as well. Once again, a link to the standards. And then we move into looking at and thinking about uh, the most important pieces of writing in high school. What you'll notice is with uh, composition standard three diminishes in uh, frequency and power 
uh, and expectations, I would say, and our shifts in expectations in high school. Moving from eighth to 12th grades, uh, narrative writing is used and encouraged to be used to bolster an argument, uh, to support, uh, to provide a vignette based on the informational piece, to set the context for an informational piece you're about to share. So narrative writing is used in service to argument and informative explanatory writing. And one of the, the newest additions to JCPS that I'm hoping uh, you guys are taking advantage of as part of NTI, and I think we're looking into next year having access at a, uh, uh, whether NTI or not on a regular basis in the district those decisions are still being made, but right now you can play with it for free, which is beautiful. And this is, and, and they stand behind some really important thinking when it comes to writing at the high school level. And uh, it, it, it circa, I think circa, and the circa stands for uh, claim, evidence, reasoning, counterclaim and audience. And because when we think about college and career readiness, this is where kiddos need to be able to uh, perform when they move into most careers, right? And so um, Think Circa has kind of packaged this beautifully in a digital platform, uh, but claim uh, the National Writing Project has been uh, toying with claim evidence and reasoning for several years now. Uh, and so really it's healthy thinking and it, it ties to, I had a session once that I, that I led at a conference called um, Not Just Because Your Mama, Not Just Because My Mama Said So, I think was the title. And then that was the title. And then I had a subtitle on, on crafting effective arguments because we don't want uh, folks who just continue to do things because they've always been done that way. I like kiddos to find their voices to be advocates for uh, standing up for social justice purposes, for example. And so uh, teaching them to craft a claim that it effectively articulates an argument is healthy, even at early primary. And I've done work with this from kindergarten through 12th grade. And then providing evidence, evidence that actually supports the claim. Not all evidence is good evidence. And then reasoning and considering the counterclaim and who's your audience, all of those things are there. And this is a link to Think Circus. So if you haven't explored that yet, I'd like to encourage you to do that because really arguing argument is the order of the day when it comes to writing in high school and not just in the ELA classroom, but in science, right? Writing a scientific argument, writing uh, a political argument in some of the uh, so, uh, social sciences. And so just applying that work is effective. They outlined recommendations. I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop right there. You can read those. You don't need me to read those to you, but these are once again, links to those documents. I'll end with this quote, writing and reading decrease our sense of isolation. This is especially re relevant during uh, COVID-19. Writing and reading decrease our sense of isolation. They deepen and widen and expand our sense of life. They feed our, they feed the soul. And so uh, reading and writing really do deserve that place at the table. We just have to embrace ways to pull it out of that silo and help us to understand how it functions to hold learning together in all contexts and give kid kiddos a voice in this world. Until we meet again, I'm Sandra Hogue. I'm AIS ELA lead. I'm accessible. You can email me. You can find me on Twitter. Please reach out if I can ever be of service to you or if you want to argue anything I've shared today or if you just want to say hi, just reach out. I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, I think Heather is still manning this call. If I can get back to the screen. Uh, Sandra, thank you again. Uh, your sessions have been great all week. Uh, we love your energy and all the content you share with us. They're just awesome.